The Honorable, the Judges of the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. Oyez, 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 all persons having any manner or form of business before the Honorable, the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit, are admonished to draw an eye and give their attention, for the Court is now sitting. God save the United States and this Honorable Court. Good morning. Please be seated. Thank you all very much. The panel is now ready to hear argument in the case of Chesser versus Chesser. Uh, Mr. Lamont. Good morning, and may it please the court. Jason LaFon, on behalf of Appellant Zachary Chesser. There are two orders before the court today. The first, the district court's order uh, dismissing Chesser's complaint as frivolous. Second, the district court's order denying Chesser's motion for consideration, which determined uh, essentially that Chesser's proposed uh, amended complaint failed to state a claim. Both of these orders are the products of the district court's abuse of discretion and should be reversed. Uh, The the government appearing on behalf of the the defendants that remain in this case does not defend the district court's first order at all. And the government does not defend the reasoning in the district court's second order. This by itself would justify remand in this case. Well, did it? Didn't your client try to represent and one of his complaints represent people he cannot represent? Uh, and don't you concede that? There are... there are. I said, don't you concede that? I thought uh, you did in your brief. Uh, we, we concede that there were named plaintiffs that, that did not sign the complaint. No, I think you concede that he was unable to represent them. That is, that is correct. Okay. Uh, and, uh, so is it error for a court to dismiss that? Uh, it, it would be an error for for the court to dismiss the complaint as frivolous based on based on the presence of plaintiffs who have not would it be would it be an error to dismiss a complaint wherein a person purports to represent someone else he cannot represent that wouldn't be error would it it would be error to dismiss that that complaint with with uh, prejudice your honor uh, the court this court in in McLean held that uh, pro so you state, don't think it was error to dismiss that complaint you just think you should have had the right to correct it? Oh, yes, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, and the well, do we need to deal with the first order if we determine that the second order denying the motion to reconsider, to the extent it dealt with the merits of the case as a whole, if that was done correctly, do we do we deal with the first order? I uh, yes, Your Honor. I think I. I think you do. I think that that a motion for reconsideration is 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 reviewed under a different light and and different factors than the the uh, 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 original order. If you have a, a motion to dismiss that's granted, and 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 the complaint in fact states a claim, and the court later denies motion for reconsideration for uh, uh, whatever reason, even if the court was correct to deny motion for reconsideration, it does not affect the fact. That the complaint still states a claim. Well, what happened if, if the if the trial court determined on the motion for reconsideration that the complaint, even as amended, fails to state a claim? Uh, yes, I think that that in all in all for all for all intents and purposes, uh, I think that that if if you if you determine that that the district court was was correct in his second order, that the that. Chesser failed to state a claim in his in his uh, uh, amended complaint. You would uh, necessarily conclude that he also failed to state a claim in his first complaint, and it's possible to, I I would assume, uh, affirm on on that ground. Now, now to be clear, we are, I think that 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 the district court was wrong in his second order as well. He uh, the district court misapplied the mootness doctrine, and and the district court conflated for the Fourth Amendment the rights Chesser's rights under the Fourth Amendment. And the Fifth Amendment. Uh, why, why don't you tell us the things you think the district court did wrong? Uh, uh, as as to the first order, the, the district court held that uh, Chester's complaint was uh, 
frivolous. The district court did not say whether it was factually frivolous or legally frivolous, but it is neither. The complaint, although it may be long and may be better organized on a second go-round, it is not the product of fantasy. Indeed, there is documentary evidence. Well, would you agree that a Bivens action can't lie against the agencies by reason of sovereign immunity? Yes. And that a Privacy Act claim could not lie against the individuals because there's no provision under the statute? Yes, but I think it's important to keep in mind that under the text of the PLRA, which instructs the district court to identify cognizable claims, and under the Supreme Court's opinion in Jones, which says that the PLRA analysis proceeds on a claim-by-claim basis, that the fact that there are claims that are not meritorious in Chesser's complaint cannot justify the dismissal of meritorious claims. Okay, so why don't you get on to the ones you think are meritorious and tell us why you think the district court erred. Sure. The district court erred by first, in the first order, not even identifying Chesser's privacy claims, did not identify his claims under the Constitution and the Privacy Act. In the second order, the court erred by concluding that Chesser's autonomy claim is moot because he later lost an interest in the care and custody of his son when there is no dispute that at the time that the individual defendants interfered with that interest, he did have it. And he seeks monetary damages for that. Those claims are just not moot. The second part, the district court held that Chesser has no expectation of privacy because he is a prisoner. And while that may be true, it simply does not have relevance to the question as to whether the government can then disclose information to the public that it has acquired about Chesser. And those are the two errors of the district court in its denial of motion for reconsideration. I have a question. Yes, sir. The district court did not consider the Privacy Act claims, did it? No. No, it did not. And so remand is already, the government has conceded that remand is already necessary in this case for the Privacy Act claims. As to the agencies. That's correct. That's correct. So this case is going back down. While this court need not consider the government's alternative arguments in the first instance here. Let me ask, Judge Hamilton, did you have a follow-up? I can't quite tell what the sound is. Did you have another question you wanted to ask there? Well, I was just going to remark that the Privacy Act, those claims can only be asserted against agencies, not against individual defendants. That is correct. They could be asserted against the FBI and the Secret Service, et cetera, but not against any individual defendants. That is correct, Judge Hamilton. But you're not arguing that that was error? No. No. But to be clear, the district court didn't consider the claims. He did not hold that they could not be asserted against individuals or agencies. He simply didn't. So there should be a remand only as to the agencies? I think that. That would be a yes or a no. Yes. The Privacy Act claims. Only as to the remand, only as to the agencies. That is correct. The constitutional claims go to the individuals here. And while this court need not consider in the first instance the arguments made by the government, if it does, it should reject those arguments. In the first instance, the government proceeds on a false premise that Chesser seeks a new Bivens claim here. In fact, Bivens itself, like this case, involved law enforcement officers violating the constitutional rights of a person who was the subject of an investigation by them. The Supreme Court has been pretty stingy extending Bivens causes of action for the last 20-some years. That is correct, Your Honor. And as this court said in Dunbar Court v. Lindsay, which is a 1990 case, it recognized that the Supreme Court had shifted gears on this but found support in the fact this was a due process claim in which it allowed a Bivens claim to go forward 
found found support in in the fact that in davis the court had already recognized a bivins claim under the due process clause of the fifth amendment now so i there are actually two to answer that first word we're not asking you to extend bivins we're asking you simply to to apply bivins to to a fact scenario that is very similar to this and lest there be any concern that this case involves substantive due process as opposed to search and seizure uh the supreme court in davis recognized a bivins claim for a substantive due process violation uh but even if you even if this were an extension of of bivins the although it on shaky ground or not as as the seventh circuit recently explained in in angle bivins is still good law and courts are not free to ignore it and in in the case in wilkie in 2007 in the case in uh uh, Minechi in 2012, the court reaffirmed the holding of Bivens and set forth two questions that courts asked before they extend Bivens. First, is there an alternative, adequate remedy? Let me ask this question of you. Isn't one reason that the court dismissed the complaint is because, I ask again, your client tried to represent people he cannot represent. Is that correct? Uh, I, I think that that... That is a reason why the court, on its motion for reconsideration, right. said that Chesser's wife cannot proceed. Right. So you agree with me. So do you think that was a valid basis to deny, a valid basis to deny the motion to reconsider, since he was attempting to represent people he couldn't represent? Uh, is that, is this yes no. No, Your Honor. You think, you think he, he could properly do that? No, but I, but I think they're separate questions. Okay. Now, as to the fact, but when, I just want to get to this point on what the district court did. The district court on that issue, do you think, do you argue that the district court was not correct? Your client could not represent other people, correct? Uh, that that is correct, correct that he could not, but what the district court said okay. was that his wife was unable to proceed. The, the district court did not say your, your well, complaint. Well, let me say is, this. He... I'm not trying to trap you. I want to lead to a question. Sure. Is this how I see it? At least on that point, the district court said your client could not represent the other people in this case. And he ruled at that time. It is a case that since then, you've tried to correct that. Is that uh, correct? Uh, you footnote and say you abandoned those claims. That is, that is, that is correct, Your Honor. But, but I, I think and so you, what is the point of abandoning those claims if it weren't to at least address that concern of the district court? I, I, I think it is, it is primarily to, since I've come into this case, to focus the complaint on the, on the most meritorious claims. The, okay, so, so just let me ask this, and I'll, I'll let you move to something else. Do you think the district court, in deciding that Chester could not represent his wife and son, was correct or incorrect on that narrow basis? Correct. Okay. What will we do? So if we just had to decide that basis, would the district court have committed an error? I, I think that... On that, that basis? I, I think yes, Your Honor. I think I, that... How, is that, how could that possibly be? Uh, because, 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 again, the, the effect would be to, to uh, 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 dismiss Chesser's uh, case completely. I, I'm just asking, just, it's more of a technical question. On that basis, the district court on that issue, it looked like the district court was exactly right. Your client could not represent his wife and his son. And you apparently agree with that point, don't you? I do. Okay. And on that point, if that was all that we had, it would not be reversible, would, would it? Oh, no, I think it would, Your Honor. I think that... that Why that, would it be reversible if well, that because was the only point in the case? Because because this court in in McLean held that pro se complaints under under the PLRA can only be finally dismissed. The case cannot be finally di disposed of under under the PLRA. Uh, can only be done on substantive merit. That's that that's controlling precedent in this court. Substantive merit is, is so you have is to required. let a client. You have to let a non lawyer practice law. No, you you have to say while 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 you. Well, you, you, cannot, want, you want the complaint bifurcated. Yes, I want it's simply simply the the parts as to the plaintiffs who are who have not signed the complaint. So each each claim, even though there are individual claims, 
claims are judged on a per plaintiff basis. This is, this is. Yeah, no, but that didn't go through to my question. I'll get Sorry. off of it. But I'm trying to say if we want to grant relief and taking that into account, on that point, I, I quite frankly don't see how the judge made any error at all on that point. No, on, on that point, if, if, the, if, if the wife is, is taken out of the case, I think that is, that is, that is correct. It's not if she's taken out of the case, it's if she's in the case. Well, no, I think, I think that, that if, if you have a complaint, for example. I, I don't want to belabor, but I don't see how anybody can. There may be error, but I'm just trying to isolate where, what it is, and I think maybe there's a suggestion that it wasn't a consideration of the privacy claims, maybe, that the district court was supposed to figure that out after reading that mishmash of a complaint. But I don't see, it looks to me like on one basis he did it was because Mr. Chester could not do what he purported to do to represent other people. And it looks like some lawyer, maybe you, figured that the court's right on that point and therefore abandoned those claims. That's what I, I thought you did it to clear up that issue. Uh, if I, could, if sure. I could take the time to answer that. I'd, I did, Your Honor. But, to, but, but just to be clear, uh, as I read the, the district court's opinion, the district court did not deny the motion for consideration on, on that basis. It said simply that the wife couldn't proceed. Did not say that Chesser cannot proceed, and I think that that if you have a complaint that has several claims, the court the court can say, well, thank you, Judge Hamilton. Do you have anything else at this point? Mr. Lafon has reserved some time. Well, I would just note that the the, the wife, uh, as far as I know, she's still in Jordan, or she can't be found. So uh, why shouldn't she be taken out of the case? I I I, I think that she should be taken out of out of the case. Thank you. You, you reserve some time. I have. Thank, thank you very you. much. Mr. Sturgill. Your Honor, I'm Lartie Stiffett, who actually the amicus, a court assigned amicus counsel. I didn't know if you want to hear from me first since I was assigned to defend the well, district court's opinion. Well, just let me say this. I, our order sheet has you... Are you Mr. Tiffith? Yeah, yeah, Mr. Tiffith. We have you scheduled third, but I'm happy to let you go now. Okay. Well, um, I will go ahead and proceed since I am the one who's defending the district court's okay. opinion. Um, and so, as you guys pointed out rightly earlier, um, the issue is really two questions, right? The first one is whether the district court erred, abused its discretion um, by denying, by deciding that the, the original complaint was frivolous. And not to, you know, completely disagree with... Um, you know, my counsel earlier, uh, but the court did specify what type of frivolousness it was looking at. It was looking at factual frivolousness, okay? And the court decided that basically that under its standard um, that it was met in the sense that there was three criteria that it looked at, okay, um, for frivolousness. Um, and one of them is whether um, it appeared that the um, complaint had... Uh, was was the kind of complaint in which a counsel would not sort of file. And it was sort of this sort of Rule 11 analysis, right? And that was one of the, the criteria it used, and that's one of the ones that it, it decided on. Um, and I think that... By the way, when you started by saying you guys decided... Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. You, mean, you mean the court? Yeah, I'm sorry. I apologize. Uh, the court, the district court. I apologize for that. Um, and the district court... Uh, uh, the district court decided that basically the um, the count was the complaint was frivolous. What do we do about the privacy claim? What I think do you we don't do have, about the privacy claim. Do I, you want I, to make an argument that that was actually dealt with? Well, I mean, I think he did. He did point it out in the in his in his um, in his opinion. He just did not in the in the initial part. He did. At least he laid out the eight counts that he saw. So he did. He did articulate it. In the opinion, he just did not provide a rationale later that said why he was dismissing that count. But well, he did I, acknowledge the count. As I understand account. the government's um, brief, we can ask them when they come up to argue. Uh, as I understand it, they have essentially confessed error as to the Privacy Act claims under the order that they should go back for an explanation by the government as to the agencies. <coughs> I understand. I, and, and again, the court was the court invited the, the government to 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 sort of join this this litigation, um, and they specifically came in to, to do it under the Bivens um, aspect. I'm not saying that they're 
and I'll, I won't speak for the government um, on that point, but I don't know if it was entirely that they conceded that there was error in the, first the initial denial of the complaint as frivolous, which is something I think the court needs to deal with first. Well, what do you, well, what do you think they mean in their brief when they say we believe that claim, this is a prophecy claim, should, should be remanded? What do you think? The, the basis for that, it seems to me they're confessing error. Because how do we do? We affirm the district court and still remand it? Well, I think that gets to the second point, which is, which is different, which is basically on the motion to reconsider and the motion for leave to amend, whether that was error to deny that. But I think the, and, that's, and that partially is the only time where privacy claims. I don't know. I, don't, I quite frankly can't follow your answer. You were asked, doesn't it appear that the government has confessed error? The government, in their briefs, say the district court did not specific. I'm just emphasizing that yeah. specifically explain why the complaint fails to state a Privacy Act claim for unlawful disclosure against the FBI and the Secret Service. We believe that claim should be remanded. It yeah. sounds to me like they yeah. think the court made an error on that. I won't. I won't try to speak for the government. The government will come okay. and talk about it. So. I'm just here to address whether, one, there, there was error, error by the district court to deny the original complaint, and I, I believe it wasn't. I believe that it met the standard for frivolousness, um, specifically factual. Um, and then the second point is, is then, then if, if the court then um, um, it either will affirm or deny that, I mean, affirm that or reverse that decision, but then whether to the motion to, to reconsider, uh, which was filed by the uh, um, uh, by Mr. Chesser, whether the court denied that and whether that was, I mean, whether the court's denial of that was an abuse of discretion. And I think while counsel now today has um, recrafted the complaint, that was not what the district court had in front of it, which is, means that it had all of the claims, including the claims uh, on behalf of his wife and his child, okay, to look at. And it also had uh, you know, and, and, and rightly so, what you brought up earlier, the court could have and, and, and seemed to have done that, which is basically initially it says that it, it, the complaint, the amended complaint violated Rule 11. And that's actually the title of the, um, of the memorandum for, uh, for the uh, deny of the motion to consider. It says the proposed amended um, complaint violates federal rule um, of civil procedure 11. Okay, that's how it starts off with. Then the court then starts in the alternative to address other issues, saying even if, even if Chester could proceed without, uh, you know, without um, his wife, and, you know, these are sort of the other rationales for denying the complaint. But I think if, if the court is to sort of focus on the fact that when he provided uh, a complaint, uh, an amended complaint to the court, which had, was, which, which was layered with errors, um, and was not proper. I don't think that, that the, the, the district court abused the discretion. So that's my point, Your Honor. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Now, Mr. Sturgill, you want to join us? Yeah. Okay. Good morning. May it please the court, I'm Lowell Sturgill from the Department of Justice, representing the two federal agencies who have been sued here, as well as four individual federal employees who have been sued in their individual capacities for damages. Under are, you, are you confessing error as to the agencies? On the Privacy Act claim that it should be remanded? Yes. As you say in your brief? Yes. Okay. Um, and uh, we do, however, believe that the court should affirm the dismissal of the constitutional claims against the two federal agencies because no court could grant any effective relief, either an injunction or damages. You're confessing error and asking for remand only on the Privacy Act claims against the agencies. Is that yeah, correct? Yes, that's correct. Not with respect to the individual 
defendants. With, and again, with respect to the constitutional claims against the agencies, the court could not have enter any effective relief on those claims. And what do you think the error was on the privacy? How did the court commit error below uh, relative to the Privacy Act claim against the agencies? The court did not provide a substantive reason for the dismissal of those claims and did not explain why those claims failed to state a claim, much less that they're frivolous. The The first time you read the complaint, could you figure out what he was asking for? Well, uh, I will say that the complaint was long, it was prolix, and there are cases that hold that when a complaint is that long and has that many documents, it fails to satisfy, uh, satisfy Rule 8, which requires a short and plain statement of the facts. Now, I think that in looking at the Privacy Act part, he did allege, if you look far enough, that uh, information about him was improperly disclosed by the federal government without his consent. And that uh, we're, not conf- we're not conceding that that actually states a claim. What we're con- conceding is that the district court should have provided a reason for... Now you don't think there's any merit to the claim. You just think the district court needs to give a reason for it in the first instance. Yes. That's, all, that's, that's the sum total of your position on that. Right? That's right. And again, with respect to the constitutional claims against the agencies, I don't hear the uh, plaintiff says contesting that anymore. I think they, they have not addressed that issue in their reply brief. And there's no action for damages against the United States on the constitutional claims because there's no waiver of sovereign immunity for the award of damages, and they haven't said anything about that. So I think those claims are out of the case, too, and you can ask them if you want, but I, that's the way I hear them, too. And I haven't heard a reason otherwise. And that leaves the Bivens claims against the individual employees. And what we're asking for there is for the court to affirm the uh, dismissal of those claims for reasons that are different than the district court gave. And as as you know, the court can affirm the dismissal of a claim for any ground that's supported in the record. We believe the arguments we have provided are supported in the record and that you should hence uh, affirm on those grounds. And I wanted to begin by addressing the one thing that the plaintiff did say this morning. He believes that, the, that he is, is not asking for an extension of the, the Bivens doctrine to these facts, and because in the Davis case, the court held that there, there was a Bivens remedy in a substantive due process context. I wanted to address that, because it seems to me, as our brief explains, that the court has held that it does have to, the Supreme Court has held that it does have to address Uh, whether Bivens should be extended when there's either a new category of defendants or a new context. We believe that this case provides a new context because, first of all, the Supreme Court has never held that there's a Bivens remedy with respect to a constitutional right to privacy, either disclosure or autonomy claim. So you have a new context in that regard. And I would also note that I think this is important. In Wilkie versus Robbins, that case also involved a substantive due process claim. The claim in that case was a, a property claim, an interference with property rights, but that also is a substantive due process claim. So not only is he focusing on too broad a level of generality in addressing whether the, the case presents a new context, but the Supreme Court's cases tell you that even in the substantive due process case that you have to dig deeper. And here again what we're looking at is a privacy claim that has never been recognized as a Bivens cause of action. So, um, again, uh, I think the primary reason why the court should not recognize a new Bivens claim with respect to the the disclosure claim that he makes is that Congress has provided a remedy uh, already for that kind of a claim under the Privacy Act, which the plaintiff himself has, as you know, a Privacy Act claim in this very case. And the Privacy Act authorizes a damages action against the United States and it also authorizes criminal penalties against Well, well at least it's asserted he has a privacy right. Claim. That's right. We're not a- agreeing that he does, but the Privacy Act does at least address the basic facts that he's relying upon to assert his Privacy Act claim. So given the fact that Congress has given its attention to the question of what are the appropriate remedies for that kind of a factual cause of action, 
it would be extraordinary for this for any court to itself jump into the mix and say, well, we think there should be an additional remedy against federal employees in their individual capacity. And it's completely, that would be completely inconsistent with this court's case. The judicial watch is the closest case that I found from the circuit because in judicial watch, the court held that it would not recognize a new Bivens cause of action where um, the claim was a, a reta retaliatory tax audit and the court said, well, we see in the tax code that Congress addressed the issue of remedies and provided for a damages remedy against the United States for that kind of a cause of action. And the court said in light of that, well, we're not going to jump in and start saying that Congress is wrong and Congress gave its attention to it and they're the best uh, situated to determine whether there should be an additional cause of action or not. And I, I would note also as our brief notes that two other circuits have addressed this question, the D.C. Circuit and the Sixth Circuit, both circuits have held that the Privacy Act does the Privacy Act does uh, preclude the um, recognition of a new Bivens cause of action. Uh, our second argument with respect to his first claim, the the disc privacy disclosure claim, is that even if you had some question about that, uh, these agents are entitled to qualified immunity because there's no clearly established law that would have put them on reasonable notice that what they did in this case would violate the, this so-called constitutional right to privacy autonomy. Uh, the uh, plaintiffs cite um, two Fourth Circuit cases, but those cases actually support our argument in the case. The Ferguson case is the first one they point to, but in Ferguson, which involved a claim for the disclosure of medical records, this court declined to say whether the, the constitutional right to privacy disclosure applied to medical records and noted the difficulty of that kind of decision. So that case couldn't have put the, these agents on notice of a problem here. And they don't have any other case that says that. So uh, again, I think in the other cases they cited are just too vague and not on point. So you really have two reasons, both supported by the record, why you, you could affirm their first claim. Now their second claim is uh, an alleged violation of the constitutional right to privacy autonomy. This is the allegation that one of the agents improperly um, uh, took actions to preclude the uh, travel of the child, TC, out of the country. And we have, again, two arguments there. The first one is the court should not recognize a new Bivens cause of action for that kind of a claim uh, because, any, because his uh, plaintiff's theory there arises out of the child custody relationship. Uh, and there was a child custody state proceeding. I think it's important to note that this all happened very quickly. The child was supposed to be flown flow out of the country on January 19th. On January 26th, there was going to be a child custody hearing. The grandmother had um, made a motion to seek custody of the child. So um, in this kind of a context, certainly there's, there's no, been no indication from the Supreme Court that what the agent did here would violate any kind of constitutional right to privacy autonomy. And, any, and he could have gone to the state court and said, oh, well, you know, I know there's a, I know there's a hearing scheduled. I'd like to send the child out of the country. We'll bring him back if, if you want him back for the hearing, but please allow me to do that. That's, that's his alternative remedy. I guess you think it's likely if the child left, he might be with his mother and maybe the courts would be unable to reach him. Exactly, Your Honor. So, uh, and that sort of, I think, uh, blends into our second argument on his second claim, which is that even if you had some question about whether a court should recognize a new Bivens remedy for that kind of a context, these agents are entitled, clearly entitled to qualified immunity because there's no case law that would have put them on reasonable notice that this was. Thank you. Judge Hamilton, do you have any questions? No. <clears throat> no. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. LaFond, you've reserved five minutes. May it please the Court. Uh, I would first like to, like to make clear a point that, that I may not have made clear in my, in my opening, which is that if, if this Court, even if this Court finds that the, that the Court was correct to deny reconsideration of Chester's motion, that does not uh, 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 alleviate the need to review the first order. Even if this court finds that, that the court the court can deny a motion for consideration for a number of reasons under under Rule 60, uh, that that does not affect the first 
You want to address, at a minimum, you want to address a privacy claim that you say was asserted in the first complaint. Yes. Yes. And so even if the court was right on its second order, the complaint was not factually frivolous. The length and complexity of a complaint has nothing to do with the facts, and it cannot make it factually frivolous. Factually frivolous has to be the product of fantasy. There were documents here. Can you tell me in a fairly brief few minutes why you think the Bivens claims are not meritless? Yes, Judge Hamilton. First, as I said, this is not a new context. The government cites Wilkie as a substantive due process claim. I think you look at that case, it's actually a takings clause case. Second, even if you were to decide that the context is new, there are two obstacles that can stop a new Bivens claim. The government asserts that for the confidentiality claim, that the Privacy Act is both of these obstacles. The government is wrong on both points. The first obstacle is an adequate alternative remedy, and the government actually combines the two because it talks about the Privacy Act as a remedy, and that's basically all it talks about. But a remedy has to be not just alternative, it has to be adequate. And to be adequate, the Supreme Court held in Carlson, the remedy has to deter the officer. A waiver of sovereign immunity is simply not enough. The government says that it would be crazy for this court to step in where Congress has said, here is a remedy for these actions for these officers. That was rejected by the Supreme Court in Carlson. The Federal Tort Claims Act in Carlson covered the exact conduct of those officers and provided a waiver of sovereign immunity that provided compensation for those officers. And the Supreme Court said that's not enough because it does not deter the officers. Again, in FDIC v. Meyer, the court justified not recognizing a Bivens claim there because it said, quote, the core purpose of Bivens is to deter the officer. Privacy Act does nothing to deter the officer. The second obstacle are special factors. The government also points to the Privacy Act as a special factor as to the confidentiality claim. And it points to Schweiker, Bush, and Judicial Watch. But the government simply misreads those cases. Those cases were not that, well, there's a scheme here that provides a remedy. Those courts, the special factor in those cases was a scheme that grants a statutory right. When that statutory right is unconstitutionally denied, you can go through a system within that scheme to get the statutory right back. So the very first thing you need is the denial of a statutory right. Chesser does not allege the denial of a statutory right. He alleges the violation of a freestanding constitutional right. Now, the government does not deny that his allegations state a violation of the Constitution. And when you lose the special factors and the adequate alternative remedy, there is no obstacle to recognizing a Bivens claim here. Now, if I could. Excuse me. In what you're arguing is that there's an implied Bivens remedy for the particular confidential and privacy allegations Chesser advances. Isn't that what you're arguing? That is correct. Yes. Well, what authority do you have for that? I have Bivens itself, Your Honor. I have Davis v. Passman. I have Carlson v. Green. These Bivens. Well, it seems to me that the Privacy Act precludes such an implied Bivens remedy. Well, the Privacy Act can only preclude those based on whether it is either an adequate alternative remedy, which it is not because it does not deter the officer, or whether it is a special factor. It is not a special factor because the comprehensive scheme special factor depends on the denial of a statutory right. This is not the denial of a statutory right. This is the denial of a freestanding constitutional right, which is simply not in that special factor. It is a misreading of Bush, Schweiker, and Judicial Watch, sorry, to say that just because a legislative scheme includes a remedy, that that is a special factor. That is actually the first step, the first obstacle, whether it is an adequate alternative remedy. And it is not adequate because it does not deter the officer. 
Anything further, Judge Hamilton? No, nothing further. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Lafayette. <coughs> are, are you court assigned in this case? I am. Uh, we acknowledge that and thank you for thank your you service. And Mr. Tiffitha, are you court assigned? We, we acknowledge that as well. Okay, at this point, at this point, we'll adjourn court. We'll step down and greet counsel. This honorable court stands adjourned. Sonny died. God save the United States and this honorable court.